So welcome everyone to um, the session on health governance. Uh, we have 45 minutes today and five presentations, let's see. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the plan. And this panel is looking at um, the effects of different health governance measures and um, health seeking behaviors in different contexts. Um, so the first presentation that we have today um, is uh, pre-recorded. It's by uh, Nayanta Rasama. She's a consultant at the South Asia Chief Economist Office at the World Bank and working on top different topics uh, related to labor inequality, gender immigration and health. Unfortunately, she um, cannot attend the session today. And I believe that the presentation is actually um, presented by her co-author, Ivan Torre. So, um, yeah, uh, perhaps we, if you want to send them uh, questions afterwards, perhaps um, you will have access to their email addresses in the attendance, uh, attendance list or um, find other ways of reaching out to them. So yeah, um, Simon, if you can start the uh, first presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Ivan Torre. I work at the World Bank. And I'm presenting today this paper co-authored with Maurice Busolo and Antara Salma, also from the World Bank. In this paper, we intend to explore the effects of government's pandemic response policies on the degree of vaccine hesitancy and vaccine acceptance across the world. Vaccine hesitancy is a critical hurdle in the fight against COVID-19, particularly now as new, more transmissible variants like Delta are emerging. It has never been more important to get as many people vaccinated as possible, also because non-pharmaceutical interventions like lockdowns cannot be prolonged indefinitely given the mental and economic costs they entail. There is an extensive literature on the drivers of vaccine hesitancy at the individual level. Education, personal experience, risk perceptions and demographic factors all play a role in determining the take up of vaccine. Social factors like norms and culture also have an impact. And lastly, policy can play a role. Information campaign, mass mandates and mobility restrictions can also modify individuals' behavior. A recent paper by Glazer and co-authors shows that when local governments lift lockdown restrictions, individuals interpret this as a signal that the spread of the disease is low and therefore engage in more risky behavior. Our paper's main research question follows from that literature. If government measures may carry an informational content about the risks concerning the pandemic, up to what point do the government's policy response to the pandemic affect the degree of vaccine acceptance among individuals? Our main data source is a survey run by Facebook covering 67 countries from August 2020 to February 2021. In 18 of these countries, the survey is carried out in a repeated monthly cross-section of a representative sample of Internet users. Our main dependent variable is the answer to the question, if available, are you willing to accept a vaccine? Our main independent variable is the Oxford Stringency Index. This is an indicator that summarizes a government's policy response by the degree of stringency. The graph on the left shows that vaccine acceptance is not static. In fact, it has varied considerably in the time period included in our sample. The graph on the right looks at the evolution of vaccine acceptance in Brazil and how it correlates to the evolution of government stringency. The less stringent are our measures, the lower the vaccine acceptance. Our analysis will look into this correlation in more detail. Social factors like norms and trust also play a role in vaccine acceptance. On the left, you can see that in countries where individuals believe that vaccine acceptance is high in their communities, their own individual vaccine acceptance is also high. On the right, you can see that the more individuals trust government, the more they are individually willing to take the vaccine. But social norms and trust differently to policy, while they vary considerably across countries, are more sticky from a within-country perspective. In this sense, policy changes can be more relevant to drive changes in vaccine acceptance. This slide shows our main results. 
Our main empirical equation is a linear probability model in which individual vaccine acceptance is the main dependent variable and where the stringency of government measures is the main regressor. We include a long series of individual controls and also control for the incidence of the pandemic at the time when the survey took place. While our results are purely correlational, controlling for the incidence of the pandemic allows us to be more confident that the partial correlation of the stringency index excludes the variation driven by the pandemic itself. The results on the left show the standardized estimates of the coefficients of the main equation. Government stringency is associated with a higher degree of acceptance in the vaccine. For instance, moving from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile of the stringency index is associated to a 5.8 percentage point increase in individual vaccine acceptance. Community norms and trust in government have a larger standardized coefficient, but bear in mind that the observed variation in these coefficients is mostly cross-country, remaining even if we include country fixed effects. The graph on the right shows the partial correlation of stringency and vaccine acceptance across country, and you can see that there is considerable heterogeneity, with a few countries having a negative correlation. These results suggest that the effect that government measures may have on vaccine hesitancy may be context-dependent. To conclude, government's management of the pandemic has varied, and so has public reception to these policies. Individual and social factors drive vaccine acceptance, but they are difficult to change as they depend on social histories and culture. Government policies have the potential to convey information on the risk of contracting the disease, and in this way they can shift vaccine acceptance. Our results show that this effect is potentially sizable. We are currently extending our analysis to better understand this effect, and in particular, we are looking at whether individual risk perceptions change when governments announce new restrictions. We ex expect to have new results in the coming months. Thanks again for giving us the opportunity to present at this conference. All right, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, hopefully there will be a, um, an opportunity to ask questions or give feedback at some point. Um, I don't see the next presenter. Uh, Simeon, do you do you see um, Shuku Wedozi Acero somewhere? No, no, In I the cannot see. Panel. No, okay, so then I think we should just move on to the third presentation by Amani Hussein, um, who has joined us already. She's an independent urban researcher and she's going to present a paper on towards a place-based approach for managing the impacts of COVID-19 on Egyptian households. Amani, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, uh, my research towards a place-based approach for managing the impacts of COVID-19 on Egyptian households um, the main objective of this research is to analyze the efficacy of policy responses to the pandemic in Egypt. It consists of three parts. The, free, uh, the first part is a brief uh, discussion of vulnerabilities in the urban health and socioeconomic context in Egypt. The second part is an investigation of the health and socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic on Egyptian households by using qualitative research methods and analyzing the publicly available data and surveys conducted by the Central Agency for Public Mobilization and Statistics between 2015 and September 2020. The third part uh, is uh, recommending a uh, resilient uh, based uh, approach for managing the impacts of the pandemic in Egypt. Uh, the urban system in Egypt has many vulnerabilities that can exacerbate uh, transmission rates of COVID-19 and make containment measures more difficult. More than 40% of the urban areas in Egypt are unplanned and have high population densities. Um, more than 31 million people in Egypt are poor and about 6 million are living in extreme poverty. Only 7% uh, of the population use fixed line uh, ICT infrastructure and 63% of the working force are informal workers. 
um, health sector has many uh, vulnerabilities uh, due to um, the low uh, government subvention, uh, medical per, uh, personnel per thousand people are very low, and hospital beds per thousand per people also. Since the 4th of March 2020, the government had um, many uh, measures to limit the community spread of the virus, uh, cancelling all public events, dedicating hospitals for isolating COVID-19 cases, uh, halting all air travel, closing uh, schools and universities, and nighttime curfew. But uh, by the 1st of uh, August 2020, uh, the government announced lifting all restrictions. Um, um, by the 1st of September 2021, only 33% of the population have been fully vaccinated in Egypt, and this is considerably low in the region. Uh, the government announced uh, stimulus policies in $6 billion uh, package, about 50% uh, for tourism sector and 0.6% health for health sector and 0.4% for regular workers support. Uh, the targeted cash, cash transfer social program uh, includes only half of the poorest Egyptians. The second part of the research about uh, the impact, the impacts of COVID-19 in Egypt, uh, I used the publicly available data to uh, calculate excess mortality in 2020 uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, in the P-score method, uh, excess mortality is calculated as a percentage difference between the number of deaths in 2020 and the average number of deaths in the same period over uh, the last five years. Uh, by comparing the P-score of Egypt and several countries, we can notice that the mortality rate in Egypt is higher than USA and close to Italy and Brazil. Uh, after cal calculating the P-score for the urban and rural areas of Egyptian governorates, we find that the excess mortality was higher in urban areas uh, than in rural areas, especially in the cities of Aswan and Luxor and Qena uh, tourist destinations. By mapping variations in mortality rates across urban areas of Egyptian governorates, we can notice that the first cluster of infections emerged in Aswan and Qina and spread to other governorates due to a laxity in implementing social distancing measures. Uh, by comparing the locations of the first Fushi with the locations of the first isolation hospitals, it's clear that the Egyptian authorities were efficient in monitoring and isolating the first cases. Um, uh, by mapping variations in mortality rates across rural areas, we can notice that the infection rate was lower than the urban, urban areas. Um, Socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19, about 62% of the working population have been negatively affected by the pandemic, 26% uh, of them became unemployed and 73% suffered from income decline. And uh, we uh, can notice that rural areas are more affected than urban areas, despite that infection rates were much uh, lower. According to the same survey, more than 60% of them indicated that containment measures are the principal reason for income decline. Um, we can, uh, according to another survey, uh, the percentage of households with insufficient income decreased after lifting the containment measures. Uh, the beneficiaries of irregular workers' aid were only 4% of the Egyptian households. And this is very low percentage uh, comparing to 63% of uh, working population. Uh, conclusions, uh, we can notice that uh, COVID-19 pandemic have deeply affected the Egyptian people uh, on the health uh, sector and the uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, sector. The Egyptian government was very late in undertaking initial, initial containment measures. Um, such as halting air travel, 
the public health and social measures were delayed and couldn't prevent the community spread of COVID-19 in Egypt, in addition to affecting the, the Egyptian household's livelihoods negatively. Uh, the economic measures weren't sufficient to mitigate the economic impacts on Egyptian households, and the government must accelerate the pace of vaccination. Uh, recommendations. Um, uh, as the daily infection rate is high, a comprehensive combination of containment uh, policies is needed to reduce the spread of the virus, strike banning of gatherings, physical distancing measures in schools or uh, workplaces, uh, use special data collection techniques can enable local authorities to assess the real-time spread of COVID-19 and develop area-based responses uh, such as localized lockdowns in uh, mo most affected areas um, instead of um, uh, lockdowns or curfews uh, for the entire country using spatial mapping techniques to identify communities that can be hotspots of local transmission uh, and the geographic targeting of these communities would help local authorities to target emergency efforts to the poor and informal workers with cash transfers or food distribution and weight and wave utility pills for the duration of the pandemic and right rising vaccination for these uh, low income areas once the daily infection rate has been lowered, the comprehensive form of test and contact tracing policies uh, is uh, the most effective strategy uh, in this uh, situation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Amani. That was a very interesting and very um, uh, rich in detail uh, the presentation. So I am not sure if we have other presenters. Um, there's technically three more presentations. Um, Simeon, did you, were you able to? Um, yeah, no, <laughs> we cannot find them. Okay. So I think this okay. gives more uh, time for discussion. If some attendees want to even like share audio and discuss, it's also possible. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's do that. I will just I will just read out the the titles um, of the other presentations so that if people are interested in the work, they can get in touch with the presenters. So the uh, one presentation was on the peace paradox and pandemic: a natural experiment of COVID nineteen effects of African jihadi groups by Larissa Navo and Henry Nanjiang. Uh, Larissa Navo is an assistant lecturer, lecturer at the University of Zhang. So um, it's a very interesting paper. Please look them up if you want to give feedback or get in touch with them. And then there is another presentation by COVID-19 time varying reproduction numbers worldwide and empirical analysis of mandatory and voluntary social distancing by um, I think the presenter was Alas Alessandro Ripucci from the John Hopkins University uh, Carey Business School. Um, it's a very, it's a very interesting, very comprehensive paper. Um, so possibly another um, area of interest for people who are attending the panel. And then I think we were missing also the presentation by. Let me double check. There's one more. I believe. Um, ah, yes. Spatial appraisal of the healthcare seeking behaviors of people with chronic health conditions during the COVID 19 pandemic in South Africa by Chukwe Dozi Achero, who's a senior research fellow at the Environment for Development Initiative and associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Nigeria. So, uh, if if some of these topics are close to your own research, um, just, uh, yeah, you can find the names in the conference program and feel free to get in touch. Okay, so I do not see any questions in the Q&A tab or in the chat, I think, no. Um, so I, I would have a few for Amani, but, Please uh, feel free to also join us on the 
I guess, stage. Um, I think you can do that if you share your audio and video. Um, and then perhaps Simeon can put you, put you up for us um, to discuss with, or I'm happy to have a very open session talking about related research or um, other questions that you may have. So, um, yeah, thank you again, Amani, for your, for your presentation. Um, now you could have taken more time, we didn't know <laughs> that you would be the only live, live presenter today. Um, I wanted to ask you, because you said that the vaccine rates were very low in Egypt, if you have any insights as to where this is mainly um, because of rollout, or if you observe a similar topic as we saw in the first presentation on vaccine hesitancy as well, and what may be the reasons for that. And then also because you, you draw on different information from different surveys, so maybe you can give us some information about which um, data sources you consult and when they were conducted, just um, interested in that as well, because a lot of the data collection efforts actually have been uh, suppressed by COVID, COVID uh, containment measures and so forth. And, and yeah, you, you also mentioned the unemployment rates um, who have, as a result of the pandemic, I was wondering if you have some insights as to which sectors were particularly affected by that or um, which population groups um, as well. Um, uh, the research has many uh, details, um, more than the presentation. And uh, the vaccination was uh, very late because um, only 7% of uh, the population have fixed the uh, ICT infrastructure. And the vaccination the re registration system requires for uh, online registration uh, in our, on our website. So, uh, little uh, so little percentage of the, the population can can register for uh, for this uh, vaccination um uh, according to uh, regarding the um, the unemployment um i'm not uh, sure but i i think that i have read about uh, this uh, this uh, this information that uh, um uh, the most uh, uh, affected uh, sector is the tourism sector because uh, all uh, uh, air flights were halted uh, in the first wave uh, and the uh, service uh, sector uh, also restaurants and uh, uh, and uh, gems and uh, all the uh, service industry uh, have uh, affected. And uh, and regarding the the service that you're talking about, where they um, where uh, was Egypt able to conduct them during the pandemic, and who who were they mainly reaching? Was it via phone interviews or? I'm sorry, I I couldn't understand. Um, you were saying like you, the information that you draw on in your presentation is um, coming from multiple surveys, right? So I was wondering if you know a bit more about when they were conducted or by whom. Uh, this, uh, these uh, surveys were conducted by the Central Agency for uh, Mobilization and uh, uh, Administration in Egypt. This is uh, a governmental uh, authority. Uh, this um, uh, I used uh, the surveys was uh, were conducted uh, in May 2020 and uh, September 2020 and uh, I think July 2020. Uh, the, uh, during uh, the the first wave uh, when um, uh, the curfew was uh, implemented and after lifting all restrictions and uh, lockdowns. Uh, so they, uh, so they served, yeah, they uh, measured the, the impacts of uh, of the pandemic on uh, on the population in three stages. Okay, thank you for the additional insights. So I don't, I don't see. Wait, let me see if there are some questions uh, by now. No. Um, is there anyone else that would like to ask a question directly, live, 
um, to Omani or with the regarding the present we want to discuss something of the earlier presentation. Perhaps the people are still in the morning hours. <laughs> Um, okay, um, is there something else that you would like to uh, discuss, Amani, or something, some el something I else? I have just would... noticed the, 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 that the presentation was too small. <laughs> uh, I well, think uh, uh, the, it wasn't clear enough uh, on something. No, no, I think, yeah, the, I think it allows you to go into presentation mode when you are in the, in the PowerPoint. But if you, if you do go to full screen mode, mode, it was actually possible to see the slides quite uh, well. Yeah. Um, but if there's something, for example, that you, uh, that you discussed briefly that you would elaborate a little bit more, we, we have, still have some time um, if you want to. <laughs> It's your panel, basically. <laughs> okay, um, I think that uh, the second part uh, is um, is the most part of uh, the, the the research. Um, I conducted um, an uh, analytical uh, um, research for this part. Um, I have uh, uh, gathered um, data uh, about uh, number of deaths. Uh, for each uh, governorate, uh, uh, all the cities and urban areas and uh, rural areas in every governorate uh, for the five for the last five years, and uh, uh, calculated the peace score to uh, uh, to uh, in the, to uh, identificate uh, the most affected areas that had uh, the, the most uh, number of deaths uh, in the country so we can uh, determine where is uh, the infection rate is uh, uh, higher than other uh, places um, and this is um, uh, the main the, uh, objective of this research uh, and uh, uh, I discovered that uh, Aswan and Luxor, uh, very famous uh, locations in Egypt, are the first Fushi for uh, for the pandemic. Uh, I think that uh, if, if the government uh, applied uh, special uh, techniques and uh, um, digital tools to determine uh, the, um, the first uh, infections and uh, uh, cases, uh, uh, the government uh, would uh, uh, handle the pandemic or its uh, consequences better uh, than uh, letting uh, the infection spread uh, everywhere. Mm. So they didn't. They didn't have uh, different measures for different locations, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and do you did you look into why um, why certain locations have a much higher um, death toll or uh, spread of the virus? Uh, I think that is uh, the first uh, cases uh, we're in these uh, places. Uh, because uh, uh, they are uh, tourist destinations, especially in winter, uh, for uh, foreigner uh, tourists. So uh, the pandemic started from there, and the government uh, was very late in halting uh, air travel. Uh, they halted uh, air travel in uh, about uh, 19 March. Uh, it's very late. Uh, uh, then, yeah, they were uh, ineffective, inefficient in their uh, policy responses. Um, also, uh, the urban areas were very higher, uh, were very high in uh, their mortality rates than uh, the rural areas. 
but um, the rural areas were uh, more uh, affected by the socioeconomic uh, implications of the pandemic than the urban areas. So, uh, if the if the government uh, was um, aware of the geographic distribution of uh, the pandemic in Egypt, it could uh, apply uh, a yeah, place-based uh, uh, approach for managing the pandemic uh, instead of uh, yeah, uh, affecting all people and uh, yeah, Yes, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I guess that there were like very different approaches in different countries and different delays. And so it's a very interesting um, point to make. I think it would have been nicely to, um, for you to discuss also with the, the other presentation that looks at like the, the, the rate of the reproduction numbers in, uh, in different, across different countries and see how it how it sits within a larger debate and a global perspective but yeah unfortunately we, we won't have the the panelists attending today um okay i mean i think uh it's uh 30 almost 35 past now so i think if there are no other questions we can um end this panel a bit earlier um so you can see what uh, the, I think there's like immediately some sessions afterwards on um, if I co co recall correctly on some capacity building sessions that are discussing different data sets and so forth. Um, um, so thank you very much Amani for um, your presentation uh, it was very interesting. Thank you for attending. Um, you. Also yeah, also to our um, other presenters who uh, uh, sent us the pre-recorded video, Ivan Torre and Nayantara Sama. Um, I, um, I hope uh, that, yeah, I hope that there will be some follow-up discussions or contacts or, um, yeah, if you find people that are doing basically in, those, like related research to your topic, feel free to reach out to them. Um, yeah, uh, yes, and as we see in the chat, uh, if you, we, and we close the session, you can move to a coffee break room. Um, or uh, I, I guess I can also leave it open if people want to have discussions on other topics. Um, or yeah, you can, you can also use the other forums of the conference for that. Okay. Um, then thank you everyone. Thank you, Simeon, for the support. And then I will see you in the other forums. Thank you. Thank you.